Welcome back everyone, Houston Map Prep here with our video on complex roots for the characteristic polynomial for a second order linear homogeneous differential equation. We start with some equation that looks like a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y equals zero. Remember a, b, and c are constants in this case. We look at the characteristic polynomial, which is a m squared plus b m plus c, same coefficients here as the constant coefficients in our differential equation. So in this video about complex roots, if we get some solutions for m that are complex numbers, since we have a and b in the original equation here, we won't use a and b here, we'll use alpha and beta. So m equals some alpha plus or minus some beta i. And remember when we solve a quadratic equation and get complex solutions, those solutions will be complex conjugates. We'll have the same real and imaginary parts, we'll just have plus minus in between. That's really giving us two solutions, one of them being alpha plus beta i, the other being alpha minus beta i. Generally, we don't want complex numbers in our solutions and having functions of complex numbers. So we'll actually go about writing this general solution as y equals e to the alpha x times the quantity some constant times cosine beta x plus some constant times sine beta x. So you can see how alpha and beta are applied in the general solution here. Our alpha, the real part of our solution, is actually the constant multiple of x in the exponential. The imaginary coefficient of our solution, beta, actually goes inside of the cosine and the sine functions as a constant multiple. We're going to go ahead and work a few examples first, and then at the end of our video we'll actually show you where this form comes from. Looking at our first example here, we have y double prime minus 2y prime plus 5y equal to 0. In this case, from our formula with constant coefficients, a is 1, b is negative 2, and c is 5. So we can go ahead and set up our characteristic polynomial, which would be 1m squared minus 2m plus 5. And we set that equal to 0, and we solve for m. This does not factor, so we'll actually need to use the quadratic formula for this. So we'll go ahead and say m equals negative b, which would be a positive 2, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which would be 4, minus 4 times a times c, 4 times 1 times 5 here, which would be 20, all over 2a. a here is 1, so this would be all over 2. We can go ahead and simplify what's in the root here, so we'd have 2 plus or minus, we'd get the square root of negative 16, which is actually 4i, all of that over 2. And if we reduce both of those things on the top by 2, we'll get 1 plus or minus 2i. So we get a complex solution here for m. Our alpha is 1, and this part here says that our beta is equal to 2. And remember, our solution form is going to be e to the alpha x times the quantity c1 cosine of beta x plus c2 sine of beta x. So we'll go ahead and put our alpha and our beta in here. So that would give us e to the 1x, or just e to the x, times the quantity c1 cosine 2x plus c2 sine of 2x. Looking at another one here, we have y double prime plus 4y equal to 0. So in this case, a is 1. Here we have no y prime term, so actually b is 0, and c is 4 here. That tells us that 1m squared plus 0ms plus 4 is equal to 0. We don't really need the quadratic formula here, I think. If I just subtract the 4 to the other side and get m squared is equal to negative 4, when we take the square root, we'll actually get that m is equal to plus or minus 2i. So this is really the same as saying 0 plus or minus 2i, right? So our alpha is actually 0 in this case, and our beta is again 2. So if our alpha is 0, think about what that will give us. That will give us y equals e to the 0x times c1 cosine of beta x 2x plus c2 sine of beta x, which is sine of 2x. Now we don't want to leave e to the 0x, right? This is just 1. So we really want to go ahead and say just y equals c1 cosine of 2x plus c2 sine of 2x.
Looking at our next one here, y double prime plus 3y equals 0. So here a is equal to 4. Again, there's no y prime term, so b is 0 again. c is 3 in this example. So we get 4m squared plus 0m plus 3 is equal to 0. Again, I don't think we need completing the square or quadratic formula here. Let's go ahead and subtract 3, so we'll get 4m squared equals negative 3. Dividing by 4, we would get m squared is equal to negative 3 fourths. And then when we square root both sides, we'll get that m is equal to, now it's negative, so we're going to get imaginary, plus or minus. The square root of 3 will keep. We know the square root of 4 on the bottom, so we'll say 2 there, and it'll be an imaginary component there. So again, you can see our alpha is equal to 0 here. Our beta is this root 3 over 2. So our solution here is going to be, now remember, e to the 0x would just be 1, so we won't have an exponential on the outside. That'll just be 1. So we'll just say c1 cosine of root 3 over 2x plus c2 sine of root 3 over 2x. Looking at our last example, 2y double prime minus 2y prime plus 5y equals 0. Very similar to our first one, but we have an a equals 2 here. So a equals 2, b is negative 2, and c is 5. So our characteristic polynomial will say 2m squared minus 2m plus 5 is equal to 0. This might appear as though it factors, it doesn't actually. So let's go ahead and use the quadratic formula here. So m is equal to negative b, which would be 2, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which would be 4, minus 4 times a times c, 4 times 2 times 5 would be 40, all over 2a. a is 2, so 2a would be 4. So if we simplify our root, we'll get m is 2 plus or minus. We'll get the square root of negative 36. So the square root of 36 we know is 6, and because it's negative, it'll be an i. So we have 2 plus 6i all over 4. We could go ahead and reduce this. Let's actually split these into two separate pieces. So I'm going to see 2 over 4 as 1 half plus or minus, and then 6 over 4, I'm going to think of that as 3 halves. I. So we can really see the real and the imaginary piece of this separate. So alpha is going to be one half and beta is going to be three halves. So we go ahead and say our solution is going to be e to the one half x or x over two here times c1 cosine of this multiple. So it'd be three halves x or three x over two if you prefer plus c2 sine of 3x over 2. So I'll just go ahead and talk you through here where the general solution form comes from when we get these complex roots. So if we start with this second order equation with constant coefficients, this is its characteristic polynomial, and we say that m is a solution here, and the solutions are complex conjugates of one another. Now remember what we've said when we get m, we should have solutions that are y equals e to the mx. So if I think of both of these as y equals e to the mx, then that would look like y equals e to the alpha plus beta i times x. And this is two solutions, right? It's really two things we can think of. One as e to the alpha plus beta i times x, and the other as e to the alpha minus beta i times x. Now if I distribute my x in each of these, and then I think of properties of exponents, remember add in the exponent means I can multiply with the same base. Now each of these are split up into a real valued function and a function that has some complex value in it. At this point we can go back to something you might have seen in trigonometry or you might have seen in your calculus experience, you might not have. But it's the idea of Euler's formula, and Euler's formula says that e to the i theta is equal to cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. So if we apply this to the complex valued exponentials here, the first one here, e to the beta i x, is going to be cosine of beta x plus i sine of beta x. The one with negative beta i x is going to have cosine of negative beta x plus i sine of negative beta x. Now if I change these complex exponentials into these statements, I do still have some complex statements here. Let's go ahead and make these arguments inside of the cosine and the sine match. 
If you think about the graph of the cosine function, it's symmetric across the y-axis. We call that an even function. In other words, cosine of a negative value is going to be the same as cosine of that positive value. So we can really turn this first term into just cosine of beta x. Sine is not an even function, it's actually an odd function. And an odd function says that if I take the sine of the opposite sine of term, then that will give me the negative value. So that would actually turn into minus i sine of beta x. Now we will still have some imaginary terms in here, right? But let's go ahead and take these and at least put these in for our complex exponentials up here. So that gives us e to the alpha x, and then we have some combination of cosine beta x and sine beta x for each of these. This one we have add, and this one we have subtract. Now the very last thing that's going to help us show you where the general solution comes from is the idea of linear combinations. The idea that some multiple of this plus some multiple of this is going to be a solution as well. So the magic step is if I take half of y1 here and I add half of y2 to it, I end up getting a whole copy of this e to the alpha x cosine beta x. But then I get half a copy of this positive i term here and half a copy of this negative i term, they're going to reduce. We'll just get some real valued function if we take one half y1 plus one half y2. If we do a similar thing with 1 over 2i times each of these and we subtract what we get from both of those, we're actually able to get rid of the cosine term. And so by taking linear combinations of these, we're actually able to get these two terms. And these are much nicer to deal with than this. So now imagine that we're actually doing a linear combination of these two terms instead of these up here with complex functions then that's going to give us some constant multiple of the exponential times the cosine function plus some other constant times the exponential times the sine function. What we'll generally do at this point is we'll factor out the common e to the alpha x, and so you get the general solution form, which again is y equals e to the alpha x times the quantity some constant times cosine beta x plus some constant times sine of beta x. All right, everyone, good luck with your characteristic polynomials with complex roots. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.